Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure. My guest today is Doug Conant. Welcome, Doug. So, great. It's great to be here. Great. Uh, great. Uh, Grace Under Pressure, it's an interview show. We pose questions to thought leaders and doers like Doug Conant. And Grace Under Pressure focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the connecting, and the commitment we feel toward others. And when you do it as a leader, um, you have to up your game, as Doug will tell us all about. So Doug, welcome. And I want to tell folks all about you. So uh, Doug is a uh, not only a former Fortune 500 CEO. He's also a New York Times best-selling author and a member on a top leadership speaker, top and one of the most influential leadership authorities in the world, and a great guy. So <laughs> Doug has his own company after being a successful CEO at, among others, Campbell Soup, um, and he runs uh, Conant Leadership, and he was at Nabisco and a bunch of other places. He's a best-selling author, um, and his uh, newest book, which we're going to talk about today, is The Blueprint, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights. Uh, Doug is a graduate of my wife's alma mater, the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern, and he served as the chairman of the Kellogg Executive Leadership Institute. So welcome, Doug. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. So uh, it's, it's, it's great to be here, as we talked about off camera. Uh, we've been working in this space together and separately now for about a decade, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, thank you. Um, so what's the outlook? Let's just take a baseline. Um, we've been in this pandemic for nearly a year. Um, what's the outlook from the perspective of those with whom you teach and coach, Doug? Uh, guarded optimism. Okay. Uh, this, look, this is a mess. If it wasn't messy, if it wasn't difficult, we would have dealt with it already. So, you know, this is, is a mess on a scale that, it, you know, is going to take a while to sort through. And I, I think everyone is pretty clear eyed about that uh, in the business community. That having been said, there is optimism about the future uh, for a few reasons, I think. The first one is, we're starting to figure out how to work in new ways. You know, this was all new to us over the last six months. But now companies and teams and, and contributors and customers and suppliers are figuring out how to work together day after day after day. We're starting to hit stride in what I'll call is a new normal, although it's clearly not normal. So I think there's a comfort level that we're starting to figure it out. And the anxiety level is palpably lower. The other thing I would observe is, I think the uh, political climate is lighter, more civil. And I think that is going to sort of help us manage the tension that, that, was, oper that was operating in society. And business has to operate within that society. So uh, between the tension lessening and people figuring it out, uh, I'm optimistic. And then if we can get the, you know, I was talking to my friend Bill George this morning. And if we can get up to, you know, 68% of the population uh, vaccinated by the fall, uh, I am, I think we can, we'll see a, some real, uh, some and a meaningful improvement. Well, I, I, I love that. Uh, we're at the beginning of the year, and it's great to have such an optimistic viewpoint. What we're all facing is something you know intimately, and it's uh, adversity. And you talk about very openly about adversity. You lost your CEO job. So what did, how did uh, you recover from that? Uh, to, to be clear, I didn't lose my CEO job, although I was very close to losing it at times. Uh, <laughs> because you, you have to stick to your guns on things. Yeah. <laughs> but I did lose my job uh, earlier in my career. And it was, we had just moved to a new place. I, I just had, we had just had our second son. Uh, this came at me out of nowhere. And uh, uh, all of a sudden I had to go home and tell my wife and my two small children in a house that had a very large mortgage that I was out of work. And I didn't know what I was going to do. Huh. So uh, 
that experience uh, propelled me on a, a journey uh, focusing on lifting my game and leadership that started when I was 10 years into my career. Mm -hmm. And I'm still, I'm slow, <laughs> but I'm still working on it. You okay. know, it, uh, I don't know how many years, let's see, uh, 30 years later, I'm still working on it. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, the best leaders sometimes are a little bit slow on the uptake. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but you have, you draw, drew lessons from that, which you share with others, and it's six practical steps. Do you want to walk us through the key uh, steps? I, I can walk you through it, but fundamentally, the idea is, you know, uh, another fellow you and I both have known, Warren Bennis. Uh, Warren who actually wrote the foreword to my first book, uh, uh, coined this phrase in 1987. He said, it's a VUCA world. It's mm. volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That was in 1987. D I did not know that. That's uh, if, if, thank you. if it was a VUCA world in 1987, in 2020, it's a VUCA world on steroids. Right. So we've got... The storms around us are, you know, unimaginable. I never imagined them. Yes. Okay. And so we've got all these challenges to deal with. And and our book, The Blueprint, is based on the concept you got to have a very strong foundation if you're going to deal with all these storms in your life. <laughs> and uh, and sadly, many leaders haven't built the foundation. They're 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 basically leading by the seat of their pants which most of us do most of the day, you know, that's life. I've been working on this for a long time. I'm probably 70% of my day is probably seat of the pants, <laughs> but there's 30% of, I know what matters most and I'm going to be focused on it and I'm going to be consistent with it. Right. Sadly, not many leaders have really done the work to build that foundation and the storms are getting bigger. Right. And then what do you do? You react to them and how's that going to work? So uh, this book about the blueprint is you got to build a strong foundation. It'll serve you well wherever you go. The six steps we talk about, which we talk about in the book, it's very straightforward. You need to envision the end you want. You need to reflect on your life experiences in order to get grounded on where you're coming from in life. Quite frankly, anytime I talk to a leader, I would guarantee anytime you do, inevitably you're going to get into a personal story of some leadership experience they had with someone they really respected and knew, and that has shaped their leadership journey. Absolutely. We I, say, I, yeah. yeah, we Thank say, you. you know, your your life story is your leadership story. So we have we help people mine that in reflection. We then challenge them to study the world around them and look at leaders they admire. Out of that, they envision, they reflect, they study. We help them build their own personal leadership model because nobody can tell you how to lead like you other than you. Yeah. You know, I, uh, it's great. Uh, what I like about you, Doug, is you've been in the seat. <laughs> you wow. know what it's like. And, uh, and, and sometimes I quote, hate people like you. Cause I go in with, uh, I'm people pitch me to be an executive coach at the top and they go, no, we want a former CEO. And I go, Oh, all right. never mind. <laughs> anyway, but seriously, uh, you, you don't know, want a former CEO. You want a John Baldoni. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, but I will tell you that, um, we all have most many of the people in, in your audience, they have they work in an organization. The organization has here's what we expect you to do. You have a performance evaluation, right? Mm -hmm. And and so most people go into these organizations and they just try and figure out how do I excel on the performance evaluation? Yeah. And you need to know how to do that, clearly. But at the same time, that performance evaluation is not designed to help you be the best leader you can be. It's not tuned into who you are or where you're coming from or where you want to go. Right. So we help people actually develop their own personal leadership model and then connect it to the company they're working for. So if I, I have my own model, if I want to behave that way, how can I behave that way and be effective in every company I work in? Yeah. And then we help them develop practices, which is step five. You know, so far, all the conversation I've just given you around envision, reflect, study, and plan is conceptual. But then I've learned the I've learned 365 days over a year over 40 years. It's how you show up. Woody Allen had it right. <laughs> and so you have to develop habits and practices that actually bring that model to life. 
in the real world in a way that signals to people where you're coming from because they are not mind readers. Yeah. And then the last step in this process is, is an improved step, which says, you know, this life is not driven by epiphanies. Life is driven by hard work. And if you can do a little bit better tomorrow than you did today, you'll be fine. And so we have a continuous improvement mindset. We're not going to try and take you to the promised land overnight. But if you figure out how you want to show up and then you show up that way gently and consistently in the fullness of time, you will live into the, your sense of purpose and, and the leadership you want to be delivering to people. That's so great part in a nutshell, that's the story. The yeah. good news is, and why I really wrote the book, is because you don't have to go to Harvard to get an MBA or to Kellogg to get this done. You can jumpstart your process in two days. We run a boot camp that helps people work through this in two days and get on a process of continuous improvement. You can even do it through the book because the first half of the book is largely a workbook, which helps people get into their, their life in a way that speaks uniquely to them. Well, I have my own copy of a blueprint and I'll hold it here. And it's one of the things I wanted to comment on is you have, um, you mentioned the workbook. There's so much tactical and practical stuff uh, and models and, and write in there. Well, see, so get there, you know, the model there and then uh, to do work, I um, think. And so it's great. It's very practical and uh, it's accessible. So I wanted to give you a pat on the back for doing that. So, okay. well, thank you. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're actually relaunching the book now because as we were talking off camera, we launched this on, I had a big book launch party on Park Avenue in New York on March 5th. And then on right in the teeth of the pandemic. And then on March 6th, we started canceling all the events. <laughs> Uh, and so it was a rocky start, still made the bestseller list, but rocky start. We're relaunching it. And uh, the the theme, the broader theme now is uh, helping people with leadership that works with honor, because we think honor and civility are mission critical today. You don't feel honored and respected. They're highly unlikely to honor and respect your agenda as a leader. That's one of the reasons I, uh, I have you on this guest as a guest, because you are someone of honor, but you're putting it in and making it tangible. And we had talked about civility. And uh, in my world of grace or the world I talk about, uh, let's put it that way, because <laughs> I fall short in, short in grace many times. Um, it's all about uh, connecting with others. And, and that relies on our civil discourse as well. So. Right, right. So well, when I think of grace, it's funny. Uh, I was a tennis player uh, and it paid my college education, my graduate school. Uh, it was a focal point of my life as I was in the formative stages of my growth. And as we talked about before, I also happen to be an introvert. So introverts can play tennis because you're all by yourself. It's just perfect. Right. But at any rate, uh, when I think of grace, I tend, when I think of a concept like grace. I tend to think of someone that embodies it. Someone that I can, what would this person do or say? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I'm a huge Arthur Ashe fan. Oh. And Arthur's book when he was dying uh, was Days of Grace. Yes. And he faced adversity and he faced challenges. Uh, and he was very tough-minded in terms of his principles and his standards, but he always showed kindness and compassion to others, always, and uh, brought a sense of equanimity with him that was second to none, even under duress. And uh, he was an introvert too, by the way. Uh, and, and I just, all I have to do when I think of how am I gonna be graceful, all I have to do is think of what would Arthur say? What would Arthur do? Yeah. And I find this notion of we actually have a whole chapter on it in the blueprint. We talk about your entourage of excellence. There's it's this group of people that you've known and admire that you carry with you whenever wherever you go. And you and you know, if if my grace is being challenged, I think about well, what would, would Arthur say? Uh Stephen Covey is in my entourage. And yeah. I, I say, what would 
you know, he was always challenging me to be a better listener. I, I would say, well, what would Stephen say? He'd say, seek first to understand before you try and be understood. Right. And so I've got this entourage of people that I carry with me inside wherever I go. And Arthur is my man of grace. Yeah. Well, so I commend that to anybody that's listening to this broadcast. Think well, of I, people I, and think of what they might do or say. Great. That's I love that concept because too often, well, you know it better than anywhere. The higher up you go in an organization, it's a lonely place. And it's really lonely now. So I like your idea of the entourage. Uh, at least you have some company there. Or at least well, you know. And I don't buy this lonely thing. I, oh, okay. I deal with the CEOs all the time. It's only lonely if you let it be. There are plenty of people that can be there to help you. But but if you want to put that all on your shoulders, you just go ahead and do it. But I, I've been in those shoes. Yeah. And there are plenty of people, both in my pat, in my entourage, that aren't – my Angelou's in my entourage. Yeah. And uh, so is Gandhi. Uh, so is Mother Teresa. I, I don't go talk to them, but their voices are in my head. Yeah. And I have people that advise me that are part thought partners with me. Yeah. It's only lonely as a leader if you let it be. And you can make a choice. So uh, I like that. Thank you. That's, anyway, that's, that's a good that's my point of view. That and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> I wanted you to um uh you brought a copy of uh uh, the blueprint, and there's a passage I'd like you to read, uh, and then we'll have a quick discussion about it, please. Sure. Uh, we talked uh, a while ago about being an introvert. I was, I, I am an introvert, and when I was first coming up through the corporate world, I didn't think it was good to be an introvert. I thought you had to be out there, and you had to look like a leader and sound like a leader. And when I was moving into the leadership ranks, Jack Welch was the CEO of the Century. And he was seemed like an outgoing, outspoken guy, and sure. and uh, so I felt that's the way I needed to be. And it turned out that I uh, uh, it wasn't my nature, and I, I was and it was very hard for me. So uh, as I've shared another story with you in the past, I actually was in a situation where uh, I, I I was a CEO, and I was had been coached by someone who I'm going to talk about in this passage in a minute. And she said, Doug, you know, you're getting in your own way here. You need to share with people that you're you're being introvert, that you're an introvert. And so that when you're standing off the side of a room in a large group of people, you're not being aloof, you're being shy. So I actually started doing that with with these folks at, at Campbell. And I said, you know, you're going to see me standing off the side. You're going to see, though, that there's that aloof CEO. And I say... I, I would tell them, it's just me being shy. So come talk to me. So I would have executive assistants coming up to talk to me at a at a company gathering, and they'd say, are you being shy again? <laughs> and, uh, and I was. And we had great conversations. And pardon the language, but I came out of the closet on my introversion. Yes. And it was so liberating. But the woman who I'm going to read to you about is a woman by the name of Deborah Benton, mm -hmm. who is also a leadership advisor. And uh, I wrote this little passage. Years ago, as I was working uh, through the improved step in the blueprint, I hired Deborah Benton, a respected leadership coach, to help me. I wanted to raise my impact in a way that pushed me a little, but still felt authentic to who I am. So I spent the day with her getting some pointers. Deborah noted that in conversation, I tended to create extra space between myself and others, which most introverts do. She encouraged me to take one small step closer to people, just one single step. Deborah explained that closing the physical distance would close the emotional distance too, putting others at ease and enabling me to better connect. Although it sounds like an inconsequential thing to me, an introvert, it felt incredibly awkward because we all designed this spatial and it was like, I'm getting too close. I better... It was scary to me. Right. Uh, I felt awkward. I didn't want to encroach on anyone's personal space. Fortunately, my desire to, be, to, be, to do better outweighed my anxiety. I decided to give it a try. It changed everything. That one tiny tweak, that one step closer, has made an incredible difference to my leadership. 
It has improved every interaction since and allowed me to engage with people in a more meaningful way. That's the power of choosing to find ways, small and large, to do things that scare you. And uh, it just seems so silly, so small. But if you're anxious about being around people, it's like it's almost overwhelming. Oh, and, uh, and so I, I, I commend the notion of small steps to people like that. What's the one small step you would take to lift your contribution profile? It's right. why I'm such a passionate believer in I, taking small steps to make big changes. I told you before he came on that because you had told me a variant of that story uh, for one of my books, uh, Lead with Purpose, and that was 10 years ago. And I have shared that, I swear, with uh, on stage when I speak, and I've shared it with um, audiences, um, excuse me, I've shared it with people I've coached, and so I think I owe you royalties, but it is such a powerful statement, and it helps people recognize who they are. Um, and so thank I want to say thank you for that lesson. It's a powerful one. So, so that, th but it's, it's, you know, we tend to think when we think of leadership, it's become mushroomed into this great big thing. And it doesn't have to be. You can break it down to things that we can actually control and do, right? Yeah. I could take one small step. It changed my leadership connections in my life. And it was something that I had I could do as opposed to think about how am I going to be a better leader? That's somewhat overwhelming. No, and and it's yeah, it's a practical thing, and I I'm something that I always say when in my coaching is try to make as specific as possible because unless a step is not as specific, it's not going to be done. So thank you, and I think you have a good lesson in here because you say, the only way out is in. Unlock your potential, get unstuck, turning inward. Explain that. So, well, you know, it's funny. I mentioned I was talking to Bill George today, and he's he's one of my favorites. I, we're, we're very good friends. Uh, and he wrote True North and Authentic Leadership, which are, for our generation, they are the book mm -hmm. that is about. And Bill would say, before you can change the world, you have to change yourself. And then our friend Warren Bennis would say, you have to become yourself. Really, uh, Warren used to say, be, and God, bless, God rest his soul, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, he would say, becoming a leader is synonymous with becoming yourself. It is precisely that simple, and it is also that difficult. Right. And so what that's the concept of the only way out is in. You have to go inside and wrestle with the leader you want to be and can be before you can just start showing up and being that leader. Right. You have to do the inside work before you can do the outside, have the outside impact. And I'm gonna uh, um, dig on that concept because when we, you know, uh, we, we say that, and um, I use the same kind of concepts and stuff, but it takes courage to look inward, does it not, Doug? So well, we, we talk in the book, there are 10 leadership traits I think are mission critical in the second half of the book, I don't, the first half, I, I try and help people find their own way, and then I tell them what I think yeah. in the second half of the book. And uh, we have a chapter on courage. Uh, I think it's the single most important attribute in the sense that, uh, and I'm stealing Maya Angelou language now, she would tell you that courage is the most important virtue because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue with consistency. Right. And so you sort of have to have the courage of your convictions, but that implies that you have convictions. And that means you got to do the work first so you have those convictions. Right. So that's why this inside stuff is important. I have found the more work I do on myself, the more well anchored I am, the more courage I have to engage with others. Yeah. If I'm not sure, then I'm going to be tiptoeing around with others in a, in a way that is probably suboptimal. And I think, you know, we talked about grace earlier. You can bring grace and equanimity to a situation when you're well anchored and you know what you stand for. Thank it's you. hard to be graceful when you're, when you're 
a, a fish in a boat flip flopping around trying to decide where do I stand on something. Right. I have found the people of grace that I know from any walk of life are the most centered people. They have, and as because they're centered, they have that sense of equanimity and they, you know, they're just sort of the calm and uh, people, they radiate a kindness, uh, a generosity. So I'm, I'm glad you've linked that to what the work that you do too. That's uh, yeah, but And the only way to do it is go inside first, wrestle with yourself. And it's not like you're going to have the answer, but you're going to have more insight. It's going to help you lead a little bit better. And then as you lead, then you go back and say, what more can I add to this to myself, and I'm glad, we yeah. people that just iterate with this process. Okay. Well, we often use the phrase, and I know you use it: leadership is a journey. But what what you're saying too is leadership is a journey inward, and we're not going to get there tomorrow. It's a it's a progress. It's a working and a progress. flywheel too. You, you know, you want to go from here to here, right? You want to, but to get there, you've got to kind of go around and around and around and iterate and you have lessons learned and then you say, okay, how can I do this a little better? And I'm gonna try this next time. And where do I really stand on this issue? So my, my belief about lifting your leadership is that it's, a, it's a, a learning continuous improvement process that in the fullness of time takes you from leading a few people to leading many. Yeah. You know, and that's I I'm, thank you for saying that, because sometimes when we look at a leader, an archetype or whatever, um, we think of them as a, a linear path and life is not linear. And I always say one of the things about grace is that we will take two steps forward and then a step back. And we have to have a sense of acknowledgement and forgiveness of ourselves before we can move forward. And um, so thanks for it's, talking it's about a that. learning system. You're yeah. on a learning system. You learn, you adapt, you grow. It's it's evolution 101 <laughs> and it's grow or die. And we suggest growth. Uh, it's a lot of Carol Dweck out at Stanford has the growth mindset. Yeah, that's what it's all about. It's about say, what did I learn from this and how can I apply it to do a little bit better tomorrow? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, our time is flying by as I knew it would with you. Uh, and but with every guest, um, I asked them to share a story of grace. So do you have one you want to share, Doug? Well, I, uh, I was in a near fatal automobile accident when I was a CEO. And as I, you know, I was in a bad way, in a very fragile state. And I dealt with all kinds of medical professionals uh, and nurses who are also medical professionals. Without question. And my observation was that uh, their disposition to showing kindness and compassion to my situation was mission critical. The grace they displayed, the equanimity they displayed when we interacted was more important, quite frankly, than whatever physically they had to do. And I remember learning to appreciate those small acts of kindness and compassion from people who were well anchored in what they needed to do and, and, and did it well. I also was exposed to people who were not so well anchored and who were not all that comfortable dealing with me. And I, uh, and I, I, I realized how jarring that felt to me and how anxious I got. Yeah. I was, I was in a bad way. And so what I talk about now, when I talk to people, I say metaphorically, all the people we work with have been in a car accident today. We've all had something's gone wrong. It's a car accident and we need help. And I, 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 I think of that every day. And then I think about, okay, how can I gracefully help people through this? So every interaction I have, it's about bringing a sense of grace to every engagement. The first thing I say in the first book, Touch Points, that we wrote, uh, the first thing we encourage anybody to do in any er interaction is to say, how can I help? And, and that is our way of expressing uh, grace. And so uh, I learned a lot from being on the other side of this 
and being so uh, fragile and how important it was that people brought a sense of grace to their uh, interactions with me. And then I think about everybody I work with and how we've all metaphorically had a car accident today and how I need to bring that state of sense of grace to them. Yeah. Well, what a powerful story. That is great. So thank you. Um, you run, tell us about the boot camp and how people can find you. So, well, if you go to conantleadership.com, you will uh, find uh, find our our story, our whole suite of services. We exist to champion leadership that works in the 21st century. I don't take a salary. Uh, uh, we charge for events we do only to cover costs. And if we cover the, and I, I'm not part of the cost, only to cover the cost of the staff in the event. We uh, if we make any money over the course of a year, we donate it to worthy causes that are championing leadership that works. Uh, we run a pretty tight budget, but we've donated well over a million dollars over the last nine years to other organizations that are championing leadership that works. So we're in this for all the right reasons. Uh, my uh, One of the writers that I work with, the co-author of this book, Amy Fetterman, uh, says it very succinct, succinctly, we're in this for meaning, not money. And uh, so that's our platform. We do run a two-day boot camp uh, four times a year where we help people in two days work through the blueprint and with a group of folks. Uh, and we help them get, on, get their journey jump-started. And we believe that uh, in order for people to really lift their leadership profile, they all can't afford coaches and all this stuff. Uh, and time, and they have time pressures. We designed this book to be something you could do in a matter of a few days, jumpstart your journey and continue through it. We also support a lot of it with our website and uh, we're very active on social media, Twitter, Twitter LinkedIn, yep. Facebook, and Instagram. Oh, great. But Doug, you've been a great guest. Um, you are a man of grace. It's been an honor to speak to you. And um, thank you for being on the show. So I'm ha happy to do it.